Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you for my colleagues who are sharing the stage with me today because I think that it marks the beginning of a very important um, development stage where we are not only creating networks and sharing information that you heard so much about today, but it also talks about the desire of people who are looking after different networks to come together and bring those networks uh, into a single fold in terms of making advances. So thank you, thank you all. So I'm going to be talking a bit about the growing impact of depression and what Ulick talked about uh, in terms of suicide interventions. Of course it goes with, together with the, uh, um, an approach to treating depression that is very, which is almost most of the times associated with suicides, uh, for the completed suicides. So some of my messaging is gonna be the same as what you heard from John, because we often talk together and we're on the same page. Uh, we want to move this field forward um, and um, com by coming together. So first I wanted to give um, uh, a, a, an overview from the point of the global cost. World Health Organization, as we've heard, has reported that mental illnesses are now the leading cause of, leading cause of disability worldwide uh, based on the adjusted life years that are lost due to depression. And they account for about 37% of the healthy, healthy years lost from non-communicable diseases, which are the main concern that our health service providers are focused on right now. Within the mental illness category, depression is the largest single factor, and it's climbing. Um, a few weeks ago, this is a, a clip, uh, 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 a screenshot of uh, uh, an article published in Nature, not just an article. This was an entire issue of Nature, which you know is the, is the top journal, one of the top journals in science, uh, dedicated to depression. And the reason why they had made it a profile issue was because of the burden of depression being recognized as being the top uh, factor uh, in, the, in the world economy. And here's their graph that shows you um, that the, the, the circle to the, uh, to the very right um, of me, and left of you, the leading circle is the representation of the burden of illness carried by depression and as compared to all the other factors that fall right behind. It is not a race we wanna win. It is that we wanna change this profile to somewhere where it is more comparable to other illnesses. And the reason why um, depression is surging ahead is not that it has gone out necessarily out of control, but what it is is that in other illnesses such as cancers, such as heart disease, that they have had quite a few years of experience in bringing their teams together, having national and international networks, large data sets that have helped them move their field forward so that they are able to have interventions that are so effective so as to kind of move them out of the scene. And that is our desire, joint desire, to kind of make it happen for depression as well. If you look at the world economy, the economic forum that was held in Switzerland in 2014 was different from the other uh, fora that they've held before. And this is the first time when they started talking about the impact of mental illness as being the largest health cost, global projections increasing to $6 trillion annually by 2030. This is staggering. I can't even imagine what $6 trillion looks like. Uh, it, it's a huge number. And, and why is this? It's because mental disorders typically start early. As you have talked about before, we're not very effective in our treatments. We're successful in some, not successful in many others. And it lasts a long period of time. So one of the overarching frameworks for the SIDRIN is really to focus on chronicity of depression. And so this is, uh, so when you put it all together, when it starts early and lasts a long period of time, no wonder it takes such a toll, both in people's well-being and in the economy. So why is this the case? And so let me reiterate what you've heard over and over again today is that in mental illness, just like we talked about anemia or we talk about a chest pain, it's a symptom-based diagnosis. We do not have a blood test. We do not have a brain scan marker. We do not have a genetic test. We don't have any such biological determinants that actually 
uh, help diagnose very clearly. And so it's all symptom-based, how do you feel? And the detection is late, and the prediction is poor, as you saw from uh, early slides, you saw that um, many people were not seeking for help, and those that were seeking help were not getting the right kind of treatment. We, despite all the progress we have made in neuroscience, etiology is not known. We do not know what is the underlying substratum. We have hypotheses, we have some good data, but we don't know for sure why. And if you look at the treatment, it's still trial and error. You will see that the treatment by different clinicians is going to be different, and there are no cures, and there are no vaccines, and so it keeps on going on and on. The bottom line is the prevalence has not decreased. As you saw from Scott Patton's slide, prevalence has remained pretty rock steady, um, and the mortality has not decreased for any mental health-related conditions. So let me tell you a little bit of a story about uh, some of the extraordinary developments that have been happening in the field of health research. And if you look at mortality from other medical causes, you will see that, um, you will see that the, um, uh, the incidence, the, the mortality rate from leukemia, for example, when it used to kill 90% of the affected kids, now we save 90% of those that are affected with leukemia. Similarly, if you look at heart disease, there's a tremendous drop in the number of people who die from heart disease. You go into the hospital these days, more often than not, you're gonna get a stent. It's not going to be an open heart surgery necessarily. And you can walk out of that hospital almost on, a, on the same day. Very different from how we used to treat, and this is all coming from research. Look at AIDS. They started off pretty badly, and now they have kind of surpassed. I envy the field of states, AIDS in the sense that they have made tremendous progress so rapidly and so there are lessons to be learned about how they did achieve the level of funding and the le level of uh, involvement of all kinds of uh, researchers and industry and people coming together to make a difference. Um, if you look at stroke, it's the same thing that you were, Tony Hakim was talking about yesterday of how strokes are so tied to depression. But if you look at uh, how many people die from stroke, we're making a, a big impact there as well. However, look at suicides. We have not moved that bar an inch. It's where it was 10 years ago. And so we have not made progress. Okay? This is, in my mind, a canary in the mine. It's just telling you um, that it is a symptom of a much larger problem. And if you look at suicide as a global issue, um, as I said, it's like a canary in the mine. So you're telling you that the underlying cause more often than not is depression, and we need to be doing something about that in a, in a substantive way. What we have done, uh, and, and people are starting to speak about that. People are concerned, and, and we had an incident in Ottawa where uh, Darren, who's a young girl who committed suicide, and their parents, uh, a coach from uh, our senator's team, um, went public. Stephanie and Luke went public and talked about their daughter committing suicide. And, and there were 5,000 people at the funeral. It was not, at one point, it would be, uh, died suddenly would be the obituary. This time, they wanted to speak about it. And what it did is that it, it galvanized the whole community. And, and before we could figure out what can we do for them, the kids, uh, her classmates and schoolmates, uh, were out the barn door like a flash, and were raising money and selling bands and doing all kinds of stuff, they started a fundraising campaign because they wanted to make a difference. It's called Do It For Darren Movement. And the Do It For Darren Movement contributed a million dollars, as did the private foundation, the McGainsland Foundation, uh, to create a chair in suicide prevention. So we are now recruiting for a chair because we need people, we need champions who are going to actually take the, take the lead on those funds. Let me come back to the point, uh, back to depression, and the back to the point that John has been making over and over again, that it, let's not just call it depression, that it is depressions. And that is part of the underlying problem with this. And so here's an example. Uh, if you look at the DSM categorization, of course, as I said, depression, we are uh, we're determining it by symptoms. This is a slide that Pierre has prepared, and it, we're looking at two different patients um, with different symptoms. 
Okay? And if you look at one has a depressed mood and is sleeping a lot and increased appetite and psychomotor agitation, is thinking about suicide and impaired concentration, decision making, that person gets a diagnosis of depression. Another second patient is very different. It's got marked loss of interest or pleasure, not sleeping much, is agitated, decreased appetite, um, inappropriate feeling guilty all the time, it's lack of energy. What diagnosis is that? Also depression. How can you have two people so far different from each other getting same diagnosis, same treatment? No wonder our treatments don't work well. Because we're not treating uh, underlying phenomenology of, of the depression is going to be different and we need to become much more personalized in our interventions. And here's the, the findings from a study that, Sardi study that was recently done showing that a third of the patients respond really well to treatments that we give. The other third shows you only a partial response and the, and the last third will not respond no matter what you throw at them, any treatment. And so, and what's even worse is that even those that are actually showing you response, 40 to 70% of them will relapse within the year. We have to change our paradigms. We have to get into what we were talking about, what Sid Kennedy was talking about in, in terms of looking at biomarkers, and as John was alluding to that too in the United States, what we need to do is to develop tests that are akin to blood tests for diabetes or blood pressure or whatever, have deconstruct our depressions and figure out what is a, a specific uh, cause for that person and how can we personalize the intervention so that that person is going to be responding to the treatments that they, that they deserve. Here's just an example of how research has made an impact in, in, as I was telling you earlier, in terms of mortality from heart disease. And you can see that what can we ascribe such marvelous results to? And I think that I would agree with John, and that is the reason why you see success rates in cardiovascular research is because they've gotten their act together. They are working as a big community now and that has resulted in big changes and should we not be learning from them. So the genesis of the Canadian Depression Research and Intervention Network was based on that premise. We were very much wanting to bring a community, create a large tent, bring best minds together and uh, create a sort of a large tent bringing best minds in research, people with lived experience, young trainees, clinicians, let them talk to each other under those tents and then let's link those tents together under a large tent. And so the Sidrin Network, as you heard earlier today, yesterday and today, has now six hubs. Each hub is a hub and a spoke in the sense that each center connects with many other counterparts uh, through that uh, region. And, and so this is really exciting development for us. And the philosophy is to collaborate. It is to focus on science of discovery, for use outcome measures as well as uh, using uh, symptom reduction to put people into, uh, from mental health disorders in the, in the centers and their efforts, and to train the next generation of researchers, which is very important, because I think we need to train the new people give them enough tools so that they can change the paradigm. They don't need to be doing the business just like we have been doing for a long period of time, because certainly we're not making the, the change that we need to. To train the next generation of researchers, we want a model whereby a student can start. So Lorraine Brewer is here in, in the audience, uh, and Glenn Baker, they're developing curriculum whereby a student can start a training in Ottawa, for example, and then uh, in psychology, and maybe do uh, neuroscience training in Alberta, and vice versa, you know. So we want to figure out we want to change people uh, for training, give them what they need to, to do what they want to. And to foster a global approach through national and international partnerships. Really, this is one of the key features of Sidrin as well. So here is the, uh, the um, uh, uh, philosophy of Sidrin that's captured very well by a painting uh, that hangs in our boardroom by uh, Morisot. Um, it shows you two people in the canoe. It's two visions of the same person, so we want to look at the science and the lived experience need to be in the same canoe in the same direction. And what you have underneath is creatures of the sea, and up above you have new information and new flourishing ideas and new discoveries and hopes, 
and then you have the transmission, the knowledge translation that is carried by the fish and the turtles across the, the waterway. And so that is sort of an emerging view of how we should be coming as a community together, sharing information and really making a difference. So Sidrin is focused on innovation, it's focused on collaborations, bringing people together, focused as an educator and as a transformer. We want to change how people re re requiring treatments are receiving the treatments that they need. So with the Sidrin's eye on the global perspective, we need to, again, focus on collaborations. And we're very proud and happy to be in good company working with, uh, as our, one of our role models, is NNDC, the National Networks of Depression Center, represented by Dr. John Greeden here, as well as the European Alliance Against Depression, represented by Ehrlich here. The idea is that they have already brought their communities together. They're working together in their countries and in their, uh, and so what we want to do is let's, let's bridge that gap as the slide that was shown by John earlier about abridging and reaching out. And that, I think, is at the end of the day what will make the difference for our community. So thank you. <laughs>